Good morning. Good morning, Kelly. How are you? Good. How are you? Thank you so much. Good. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. I can see you. Yeah. Sorry for the technological challenges. It's okay. It happens. It's inevitable almost, I feel like. And we're all trying new things. Well, thank you for taking time again. I'm really thrilled. I want to fill everybody else in who's tuning in, and I'm sure others will jump in. Um, that we're here joined by Representative Marilyn Strickland, who represents Washington's 10th Congressional District in the U.S. House. She was elected for the first time to the House in 2020, so part of the success um, that we try to measure and document in a new report from COP um, called Measuring Success Women in 2020 uh, Legislative Elections, which you can find on our profile links, etc. Before serving in Congress, Representative Strickland was mayor of Tacoma, Washington for eight years from 2010 to 2018. Um, so I'm just giving the short bio, but certainly uh, you will learn and can find more. But thanks again for taking time to talk with us this morning um, and trying this format. This is new for us, so. Sure, I'm gonna try to turn the volume up, Kelly. Okay. Okay, how does that? All right, can you hear me can you hear okay? me back? I can hear you all right. Yeah, okay. absolutely. All right. So one of the things, we'll jump in, one of the things that we try to document in this report is, you know, record number of women ran for our congressional office again in 2020. This was coming right. off the heels of 2018, which was really celebrated as this, you know, pink wave surge for women, et cetera. Lots of success, especially for Democratic women. So for you, after already serving, um, as mayor in a top executive position for eight years. What spurred your decision to launch the bid for Congress in 2020? And was it a decision you had made sort of a long time ago independently? Um, or was this something that came together with, with or by the urging of others or maybe a little bit of both? Yeah, so you know, when I left the mayor's office in 2017, I went to go work for the Seattle Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce as their CEO. And to be honest with you, Kelly, I didn't think I was going to run for office again, simply because there was really nothing that was of interest to me. I knew that there were other ways I could serve the community and working on economic empowerment and economic opportunity was always a big part of my platform. And so I really didn't think I was running for office again. And then my predecessor, Denny Heck, kind of surprised everyone and announced he wasn't running for re-election. So I think he just kind of started this scrum where I was getting phone calls and text messages. And, you know, we just think about it. And when, you're, when you make a decision to run for a job like Congress, especially if you live on the West Coast, you're making a lifestyle decision for your family. Sure. So a lot goes into that. And I'll talk a bit later about, you know, why are women always asked, how do you balance your job and your family? But, you know, it's, it's a big decision because you're traveling in each direction five hours usually, you know, every weekend or every other weekend, and it, you know, it, it can take its toll. But, you know, we decided it was time to get in for a few reasons. If you look at the South Puget Sound in the district that I represent, which is, you know, parts of Tacoma and further south, it's growing, it's changing, and the federal government, you know, it has a significant role to play to help us manage that growth. And so that was really what got me in, and also just my deep abiding love for the place that I call home. Right. Yeah. And, and one of the things we cite in the, in the report and just in our research at COP, you know, be doing this almost five decades um, and looking at the different paths women take, but yep. often that it's that combination, right? It's like that desire to make that change, you know, yep. to care about your community, care about the economy um, tied with opportunity. You know, yep. there's a political opportunity, there's an opening and the more we can get position women in those those moments of opportunity, yeah. the more yeah. we expand the pool. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and I think this is a really interesting, um, the, the word that you chose, you said opportunity. And I remember when I was talking this over with folks, you know, people I know, and even political consultants, they said, well, don't use the word opportunity because people will call you an opportunist. And it's interesting, interesting because I never hear men get told to apologize for their ambition. Right. But as a woman, they said, well, you can't use that word because that just sounds like you're trying to take advantage of something. And I said, well, when you go to a place like Congress, your job is to help people. Right. So if opportunity to help people, that's fine. If helping people is part of my ambition, I'm going to speak it and I'm not going to be ashamed of it. But it's interesting just the nomenclature we use around women wanting to have careers to advance and be ambitious and how we try to play it down like there's just something wrong with that. Absolutely. Which does speaks to this point um, 
about how you run and the way you navigate gender yeah. and identity on the campaign trail. And we, um, you know, I included your opening ad. I love your, your introductory ad um, in the report because one of the, the points you're trying to make is that success for women isn't just numbers, right? But it is also pushing the boundaries and how we run and how the things we value in our elected leaders, the things right. we sort of allow. And in that ad, you talk about your own identities, gender, racial, and intersectional identities. You talk about the experience of discrimination of your parents. And I just wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how you view those aspects of your identity as tied to your public service and how you thought about navigating them, surely probably before this race um, uh, as mayor, but also in your congressional race. You know, I would say that probably a decade or two ago, if you got into some, you know, if you got into politics, there was probably what I would call a cookie cutter of how people thought you had to comport yourself and what your qualifications were. And I would say, given where we are right now as a nation, as you know, as how we look at governing and policy making, it is important to bring your authentic self and to tell your story. And if you're a woman who has been in a career as long as I have, you're not always historically been encouraged to be vulnerable and to show your authentic self. And so as we thought about telling the story in this campaign, you know, it was a field of 19 people, first of all. And so, you know, in a crowded, crazy, top two scrum like we have in Washington State, you have to tell your story and you have to do the things that really differentiate yourselves. And, you know, Kelly, I remember hearing from one of my supporters who said to me, well, why do you talk so much about being the first black person running for office? The first black person to represent Washington State. And I remember thinking to myself, why is the fact that I'm half Korean not the issue for him? Why is the fact that I'm calling my blackness and being proud of it? And so it's interesting, you know, as you talk about intersection, but my family story, as you know, is one that is not that unusual for people who live in the Northwest, especially if you have a parent who's in the military. So I tell the story of my father being African-American, my mother being Korean, being born in Korea, and then coming to the States for the first time and how their experience with me as a baby in the deep South, where it was illegal for them to be married, was not a positive one. And that's part of my story. And so when people say to me, what motivates you now? I talk about the story of my parents that I don't remember, but I was part of it. I think about the shoulders that I stand on and how people had to fight for basic human dignity, for human rights, for civil rights, for the right to fully participate in society. And that is what drives me. And you think about where we are right now with all these things happening in this country. And in some cases, it's kind of a bit of back to the future. And so my voice is needed at the table and I need to speak out for my communities because it benefits everyone. And I think that's a really important thing to note here. Yeah. I mean, one of the things we try to emphasize, and I think you've just illustrated so well, is we value other things, right? We value experience as a veteran. We value experience, you know, in, in many different aspects of often professional identities, but lived experience that comes from gender, racial, and intersectional identities are also shaping what you bring to the table and how you represent the sort of fullness of your constituencies, for sure. You know, and the other thing that's interesting, too, is how we define identity politics. Yeah. Everyone has an identity, regardless sure. of who you are. But when you talk about people of color, people often say, well, why are you talking about identity politics? There you go again. And so, again, it's just interesting how we define and the words we use to describe things. Absolutely. So let's talk about being mayor and, and what that brings. Uh, obviously, that's another sort of area of qualifications and experience that you bring to Congress that's very necessary. We were looking at the list, and surely there are other, there are other mayors, but it is more common that folks are coming from the state legislature, they're coming yep. from sort of that aspect of politics. So sort of in what ways did your time as mayor of Tacoma help you while campaigning? And also, how does it help you in doing your work in Congress? Well, thank you for that question, Kelly. You know, when I was on the campaign trail, I talked about being mayor as a strong qualification for going to Congress. And there are, from what I understand, 30-something former mayors who are in Congress right now. And even the Secretary of Transportation is a former mayor. The Secretary sure. of HUD is a former mayor. And for me, bringing that lens of understanding how local government works is so crucial given what we're experiencing right now in this country. I would also say too, the, you know, understanding that when you're a mayor, you know, I'm a lifelong Democrat, but in Tacoma, you ran as a nonpartisan. 
And so my focus was on the problem at hand, not necessarily partisan politics. So that's been a shift for me. But I would also say that having the lens of local government is what got me to advocate to ensure that the American Rescue Plan had $350 billion in there for cities of all sizes, because in the first round, some cities got left out. So I think it's just having a very on the ground look at some of the problems and an understanding of how the federal government can be a good partner through policy or through funding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it also gets to this point where you're talking about ambition and some of these gendered, you know, ideals of what yep. we have, that we have fewer women in these executive roles and that yep. that skill sort of being able to tout that um, it pushes back against folks concerns, if any, right. that, that women can't be in these roles. Um, so while well, women have made lots of gains and broken barriers, uh, we at COP sometimes are the wet blanket because we're always like, there's more to, there's more to <laughs> right. do. Um, you know, we're not yet there. Yeah. And so we certainly aren't. Um, and that's true for women. That's true. You know, we saw with the ascendance of Kamala Harris to the presidency, but that right. also means there's no black women in the Senate. Um, so, you know, there's, there's often uh, challenges to still work left that we need to focus on. What do you see as the work um, necessary to continue to increase the number of women in elected office, as well as to expand the full sort of range of diversity of women who run and serve? Well, you know, the 107, <clears throat> excuse me, the 117th Congress is the most diverse in the history of Congress, but we still have what I call that one quarter ceiling. So, you know, there's been, there have been great gains, but it's only 25% of the members of Congress who are women. And so as I think about what we need to do, I mean, you know, I'm grateful that there are organizations like Emerge, like, you know, Higher Heights that, you know, support women and in Higher Heights case, support African-American women who want to run for office, often Congress. I would also say that we have to do a better job of building our bench and succession planning. And so, you know, we want women running for school board, city council, county council, state legislatures, whatever they want to do, and making sure that when there are open seats, we have qualified women who can raise money, who understand the basics of how you campaign, and you know this part, and have the ability to experience the rough and tumble of what a campaign can be. Because if you're new to it and the stakes are high, it can be very, very um, rough on you. It can be rough on your family. People say things about you that number one, aren't true, that are exaggerated and sometimes are very hurtful. And so just having people be prepared for what it entails. And that really means having a support network of yeah. people you can turn to who are going to encourage you. Because I tell folks, when you're recruited to run for office, everyone's like, I'm going to support you. I'm going to be there. I'm going to turn out. And it can be a lonely place sometimes when things yeah. get crazy. <laughs> yes. We always say, you know, folks are very into asking women to run. Yeah. And while I support that, I'm like, yeah, but you got to go beyond asking, right? Yeah. So you've asked a woman to run. You've got maybe helped her jump into the race. Right. She's got to have that support system all the way through election day and quite frankly, beyond win or lose, really. Yeah, you know? totally. Totally. No, and I'll tell a funny story. Um, you know, when I first ran for city council, you know, I, someone, you know, so, someone encouraged me to run for office and he was very enthusiastic and he said, okay, I'm going to be there for you. And then he says, oh, by the way, I'm going to go on a four month trip around the world. And I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> you got me here. <laughs> like, no, you're not. You're going to stay right here. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I mean, I, I always think about that in, in a lot of the work that women's organizations do, et cetera. Mm -hmm. It's like, we got to, it's the investment along the whole, the whole Absolutely. path. Um, so I know you've got more things to do today. So I just want to end with a question about success and how we measure success. Um, as I said, that's a sort of title of this report that we pulled together. Um, so our sort of argument is there's lots of ways to measure success. Right. So we've been keeping track of the numbers for 50 years, but there are ways to look at success for women that go much more beyond how many candidates, how many women are in office, et cetera. But how do you look at it? How do you measure success for women in American politics? So, you know, I would say, first of all, the numbers do count because we need the data points. Yeah. <clears throat> I would say that making sure that the women who we count are also a reflection of the entire community so that we're including women of color, that we're including women from the LGBTQ community. So that is a full representation of all the things that we are. I think that's important. And then of course the policy making. And 
you know, this is, you know, it, it, it varies depending on the body that you're part of. If you were in a blue state with a Democratic majority in both chambers, it's a lot easier to say I was successful. Right. If the U.S. House of Representatives with a slim majority and a Senate that needs 60 votes, it's going to be a little different. But here's how I would look at success. I tell people that, you know, when you have the privilege of serving as an elected official, passing legislation is not the only way you measure success. And I say this because one of my colleagues I spoke with, when I was considering running for Congress, she said to me, she said, don't think that passing a bill is the only way you're gonna be successful. You have a platform, you can speak out, you can advocate, you can gather people, you can start initiatives. So use your power and your platform to do a lot of good for a lot of people. I think that's a really good way to think about it. And then finally, you know, the ability to address some of these things for me, you know, I always come back to economic opportunity and economic power because so much of that is tied to social and political power. And so we know that the systems that we operate in as women, especially as women of color, do not always welcome us into positions of power and authority, the social, political, and economic systems, but economic empowerment, you know, being able to live securely, to have your basic needs met, to build wealth, especially because of the wealth gap that exists between communities of color and white communities. Those are some of the things that you can have an effect on as a member of Congress, as a city council member, as a member of the state legislature, as a governor, as a president, you know, all the things, as a mayor, all the places where we need to show up. So that, that's really my message here at the end of the day. I believe that economic empowerment can often lead to social and political empowerment. Absolutely. And, and I would add on success that simply folks seeing you in yeah. power, you know, and, and we have a hard time in political science, you know, in academia measuring the yeah. importance of symbolic representation. But I really truly believe it. We see it and hear it. I'm sure you do as well. Yeah. Um, that simply being in these institutions, as you said, sort of using those platforms and people saying, okay, I can do that too. Right. Or even if these are, you know, young boys saying like, oh, that's what power looks like, that this makes a difference. So um, I just want to thank you um, for doing that, for doing the work, for inspiring um, not only your constituencies in Washington, but, but more broadly across the country. And, you know, for those of us who try to work for getting more women in office, we're really grateful of the women who do the work, <laughs> who walk the walk. Um, and so provide us all those examples to, to share with people about why it's so important that you're at the table. So thanks for taking the time this morning. Good luck in the, the rest of this first first year of first term in Congress, and we're really grateful for the work that you're doing. Great. Well, thanks so much for having me, Kelly, and thank you so much to the Center for all the work that you do to bring the receipts, show the data, and to really encourage women to support each other and to run for office. I do appreciate the work you do. Absolutely. We're glad to do it, and everybody who's tuning in should follow Representative Strickland on this account, on her Twitter account and elsewhere to follow the great work. And then also if you're interested in reading the longer report about what happened and women's success in 2020, it's at womenrun.ruckers.edu. Thank you again. Have a great day. Have a great rest of your week. Great. Thanks everyone. Thank you.